Okay. Can everybody hear me? Yep. Okay, great. Well, let's start then. Uh, and if you're coming in late, just go ahead and fill in. So, 884. Can anybody out there guess what this number represents? <laughs> Close, no. Also incorrect. No, go ahead and shout it out. There's no such thing as a stupid answer. Very close, yes. No. <laughs> Actually, that might be true. Yeah. You win the prize for the best answer. Uh, the White House website has been running on Drupal for 884 days. That's pretty astounding. Here's the next one. Give me your real answers, your snarky ones. Go ahead, shout it out. It's after lunch. I want you guys to wake up. Uh, yeah, very good. You win. 106 contributed modules powering the White House website. Also pretty cool. How about this one? Anybody guess what this is? No, that's not true. Anybody? <laughs> You're very close. Uh, think of that number. I'll tell you what that is later. So, last one. 836. What's this one? This one's my favorite. <laughs> okay, yes, that's, tr that's correct. It's my room number. 836 public contributors to the modules that support White House website. You might see your name up there. That's pretty cool. Uh, and what that means is we have an average of about nine engineers working on every single module that supports the White House website. That's really big. We have a huge engineering team for every single module that supports the website. So, I'm gonna go over four things, but before I do that, I wanna get to know my audience. I wanna know if this is a friendly crowd. Uh, so, uh, if you could raise your hand, how many people in here are hardcore Drupal people? You guys know a lot about Drupal. Uh, you've been doing Drupal for a long time. All right. And then the opposite of that. How many people are new to Drupal and you're really curious about Drupal? Okay, so it's half-half, okay? Especially you there in the front. Uh, raise your hand, how many people here like to drink beer? Yes, everybody, good. So I'll see you guys later tonight. Uh, so it seems like this is a friendly crowd, good. Uh, so the four things I'm gonna go over, open government. What does it mean? Why is it important? The second thing is the history of the White House website. Third thing is a roadmap to the future of the White House website. And the final thing is citizen engagement on the White House website. How do we do that? So, open government. What is open government and why do we need it? Well, the president came to office on the 20th of January, 2009, with the promise of making government more open and more transparent. The following day, he signed the open government memo. And the three core principles of this were transparency, participation, and collaboration. And what this really signified was a huge paradigm shift in government. It states that the government's number one priority is to provide service to the public. And the subtext of this message is that we're really trying and we need your help. So that is the metaphorical stool that represents open government. It's really easy. You have three legs. If you don't have all three of these legs, you fall down. Open government doesn't work. So I want to take a few minutes and discuss each of these principles. Transparency. Why is transparency important? Transparency promotes accountability. 
With transparency, citizens can get information about what the government is doing for them. If you can peek behind the curtain of what's happening in government, like the Wizard of Oz, you have more confidence in your government because you can see what they're doing. It breeds confidence and trust in your government with accountability. How do you become more transparent? You share data. The government has a lot of data, an unbelievable amount of data. And what's really important to note is that the government is the steward of this data. The vast majority of this data is and should be public data. And it's a national asset. And therefore, as much of this data should be liber liberated. And when you do that, you democratize the data. And you create a platform on top of which people can create things. They can innovate. And you're really encouraging innovation and participation. That's the power of open government sharing of data, which is a great segue into participation. The second principle, at the heart of open source, you have people. Without people, open source fails. And if the heart is people, then the soul is engagement and participation. Uh, open source is really a great opportunity to participate. And it's been said that open source is one of the greatest forms of civic and citizen engagement there is out there. I tend to agree with that. I'm sure that a lot of people out there agree with that. So what's really important is if we can create a dialogue through citizen engagement, we can make our government better. Because we're all in this together, and we need to work together to help each other out. This is our government. It's not an us versus them. We need to work together. And it's incumbent upon people to participate in their governments. We should know that there's a generation of digital natives out there that are graduating high school and college that don't remember a time before Facebook, shocking, texting, the ubiquity of all these social networks. And they have a different idea of privacy as well. They expect this transparency and they expect this participation. The government is not the core of knowledge. It's not the hub of expertise. We do not have a monopoly on expertise, which means it's really important for the government to reach out and solicit assistance, and vice versa, which is the third principle, collaboration. This is the lamest picture I have, sorry. <laughs> but they're clearly collaborating. <laughs> Why is collaboration important? Collaboration is important because it can take a good idea and surface that and really make it a great idea. So back to the fact that the government is not the hub of exper uh, experience. Knowledge is distributed throughout cities, countries, everywhere. It's really important for government to engage with the public to leverage that collective intelligence. How do you do that? Hopefully some of you took microbiology in college. I love these big words, sorry. But internal and external collaboration. The first thing you really need to do is collaborate within your organization. If you cannot collaborate with the guy sitting in the cube next to you, you're in a big pickle. You need to collaborate within your organization across business units, people in your office. And after that, you really need to reach out outside your organization, public-private partnerships. And why is that? That's because technology in and of itself will not solve your problems. It's just an enabler. I don't care how good the technology is. 
without people working together, technology will fail. So at the core of success with technology, you have people. Okay. So how does this fit into the White House website? How does the White House website jive with transparency, participation, and collaboration? So I want to go back in time a little bit and teach you a little bit about the history of the White House website. The White House is the people's house. Therefore, by transitive property, whitehouse.gov is the people's website. So we're going to jump on our DeLorean time machine and go back 18 years to 1994. Awesome. <laughs> this is the website in 1994 as it was launched in October of 94, Clinton's first term. Beautiful. Now, we can laugh about it, but at the time, this was really cutting edge. I'm serious, this was cutting edge, the reviews were great. And why were the reviews great? Because this was the White House opening up and allowing access to everybody that had an internet connection. One of those free AOL disks you picked up. You could access the White House website. Now there are about 3,000 websites online at the time. Now it's a lot more. Some of you may not remember 1994 at least not very well. So let me show you what happened in 1994, other things that were relevant. In 1994, that was the biggest browser out there. It was a great browser. What happened? Firefox is good, though. Most popular movie in 94? Can anybody guess what the most popular movie was? You got it. I want you on my team for trivia night. <laughs> Forrest Gump. And the third thing I want to show you, in the interest of personal transparency, I want to show you what I looked like in 1994. <laughs> Thank you. I looked awesome, too. I was a big fan of Kurt Cobain and Nirvana. There's one more really big thing that happened in 1994, and if you are a parent of a teenager, you're either going to hate this or you're going to love this. I'm indifferent because I don't have a teenage kid. In 1994, <laughs> Justin Bieber was born. I promise that this is not irrelevant. I do have a salient point, so hang with me. Yeah, I feel old too. Drupal is the Justin Bieber of content management systems. <laughs> Why is that? Now you may or may not agree with me when I say Justin Bieber has talent. I don't think his music is that great, but he has talent. But he would not be who he is without his community, his fans, his ecosystem. Drupal is good software. It's great software. But like Dries said this morning, what really is powerful is the community behind it. It doesn't matter if you have the best software package out there. If you don't have a community that supports it, you can't go anywhere. So let me pivot and talk to you about new media. I want to define what new media means to us. This is a holistic view of new media. We have four interconnected disciplines. The first is content. What's your message? What are you going to say? What are you trying to tell the people? The second, how do you want that to look? What's the design? Colors, aesthetics. The third, what's your vision? Why are you doing this? Where do you see yourself in a year? And the fourth, and in my mind, the most important, how are you going to do that? You need something to enable that, and you need technology. 
And what's cr critical is that you have to understand that these four overlap. And without all four of these, you do not have a successful new media program. So at the White House, we have a simple mission. Our technology is there to ensure the security, stability, and scalability of the president's website. Now in my mind, there's no more important website out there than whitehouse.gov. I'm a little biased, but it's true, because that's the first interaction many people have with the president. And for new media technologies, there are very few accolades because, frankly, it's just supposed to work. And when it doesn't work, we get the exact opposite of accolades. Some of these guys up here know what I'm talking about. I apologize for those calls, late night calls. So let's talk about our goals. We have a couple goals at the White House, fairly simple. We want our technology to be enablers to facilitate the amplification of the president's message. The website is a very easy way for the White House to communicate to everybody out there. That's obvious. That's abundantly clear. The second is really our goal is to embrace open government and enable it with these tools. So we took these goals and we applied them to the new whitehouse.gov when the president came into office. So this is the website as it was in the previous administration. It's very different. It was very link heavy. The goal was to reboot the brand to reflect the incoming president. It's important to note that this was only the second time in history that a website was part of a presidential transition. So needless to say, it was a little chaotic. There wasn't a lot of experience on how to do this. And this is what the result was. It's different. It's better. Turns out it's really not easy to launch a website for the leader of the free world in 77 days. It's not easy to launch any website in 77 days. But we did it. But there were some challenges because the tools that were provided to us were procured prior to the election. So there was very little input. Hence, the parameters within which we had to operate were already defined. And that was very difficult. So it wasn't without its bumps. We had some problems. System wasn't flexible. It was really cumbersome to get anything built out in the proprietary content management system that we used. We were really pushing the boundaries of the system. It was really not able to do what we needed it to do. And here's that thing again, community. The lack of a community was a really big problem and often very much overlooked in procurement processes. So we started looking into options. And needless to say, we were overwhelmed because everybody out there knows that the CMS space is really a commodity market. This is just a handful of them. There are thousands of content management systems out there. Some of them are awful. Some of them are great, but it really depends on the situation, and it depends on your requirements. Well, we looked to this guy. We chose Drupal. People thought we were crazy. Maybe. But people thought we were crazy only because this was something that had never been done in government at this scale. But just because something is crazy, and just because it hasn't been done, doesn't mean it shouldn't be done. 
there's a huge selling point. It's free. That's cool. But you also have to remember that it's really not free. The software is free, but the support of the software is not free. But that is a selling point because you could take the money or resources that you would allocate to the software licenses and shift that to the support of the software. That's a much better model in my mind. Here we go again. Community. This is a theme that's going to be over and over. The community was excellent, and this was one of the largest reasons why we chose Drupal. It's good software with a great community. And being that it's open source, it's very nimble, it's very flexible because we control the entire stack. Now, we control everything from the operating system all the way up through the content management system, and we can do whatever we want with it. So how did we get past that crazy comment? You have to fight the FUD. Some of you may know what that means. Fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And in order to do that, we had to address three key issues. Procurement, security, and culture. Well, you address the first thing by talking about buying a service. You're buying people and their service to support the software. OK, I can understand that. The next one is security. A lot of people say open source security, uh, open source software is not secure. And I'll say, well, yeah, that's true. But there's a lot of proprietary software out there that's really horrible, too. It has nothing to do with being open source or closed source. It has to do with the quality of the code. I don't want that argument that open source is insecure. It's not insecure. I would much rather have a million engineers looking at my code than 10 engineers looking at this proprietary code, and that's it. You're much more likely to surface problems that way. And it's really in the interest of the community to have secure software. Otherwise, that community dies. Now, this one's the most difficult in government because the status quo is often easier. Not often, it is easier. People don't lose jobs over not taking risks. People lose jobs over taking risks. But you really need to foster and embrace that culture of change. It's this constant innovation that Dries was talking about this morning. This one's a little altruistic, but open source is being part of something bigger than you. That's a huge benefit. So here's the most difficult thing that we had to uh, attack. And if you're trying to do the same thing, this is also going to be difficult for you. And you probably see a lot of these words all the time, or hear them. And frankly, it sucks. You feel awful. You feel defeated because you're really trying to do your job, and you're trying to innovate. But you constantly run up against a brick wall, and it makes you feel powerless. So try to use these words. I know it's easier said than done, but use things like we can, we will, it's possible to do it, you know, acknowledge that it's a challenge, but you need to try. And if you don't try, there will be no progress. Failure is a sign that you're trying. Don't be afraid of failure. That's my dog, by the way. That's not my kid, though. So, so now that we have the site in Drupal and we have control over the entire stack, what's next? So we want to go back to open government. We need our open source technology to drive more of this. We need more transparency, more participation, and more collaboration. Some of the things that we are looking at and have been looking at, building applications, of course, 
hackathons working with the Drupal community, releasing more code. We've done that before. Mobile, another thing that Dries talked about. So how do we do that? That guy, Drupal. We leverage our Drupal platform. So why do you keep innovating? So this old guy, Isaac Newton, has his laws of motion. And these can be applied to websites as well. Open government is not static. It's constantly evolving. A website at rest tends to stay at rest. Your website's not done. It shouldn't be done. A website in motion stays in motion. Constantly be evolving. Constantly innovate. Here's something important. The tools of today are not going to solve your problems tomorrow. And that is especially true with technology and even more so on the web. Don't get locked into something today and think that it's going to solve your problems in two years because you're wrong. Don't allow yourself to settle into a comfort zone. Remember? Trying is fine. Failing is fine. Look at new strategies, new technologies, new techniques. Because the true value really comes at the intersection of all those. So I want you to remove some of these words from your vocabulary. Because they're evocative of really a linear process. A beginning, a middle, and an end. You're never done. You're not complete. You should look at them and replace them with these. Because this is constant innovation. Your website is dynamic, it's fluid, and it should always be evolving. It's a living thing. A website in motion stays in motion. So we're rethinking our technology strategy, taking this into mind, and we think of our CMS as a framework. And we leverage things like the multi-site capabilities of Drupal to provide a single stack across a number of websites. And that's when you really start to see scalability, that horizontal scalability. Shift your focus from a website to a web platform. When you have a platform, you have something on top of which you build things. And you build things to encourage engagement. And those things that you build are apps. Everybody loves apps. So that technology now can be used to enable applications that support the Open Government Initiative, transparency, participation, and collaboration for citizen engagement. OK, now the fun stuff. Now, we've been pontificating about all these great things that we're going to do, but we need to figure out actually how to do that. So this is the actual next phase of the White House website. And what we're doing is really trying to embrace the latter two principles of participation and collaboration through open source technology. Now, we know in new media that we engage the public to build buzz, to raise awareness for issues, but it's a little bit more challenging to build a framework that allows you to collect feedback from people. That's a little bit of an engagement tool. So we wanted to figure out how do we engage the public and address issues that matter to them. We shouldn't talk about what we want to talk about. We should talk about what the public wants to talk about. So what if we had a targeted institution like the White House that built a clear framework for engagement with defined expectations for a response? OK. What does that mean? Well, that means we're accepting feedback, and that's fairly straightforward. But what's really unique and, frankly, quite complicated is how do you answer that? Every day, 
the press secretary answers questions in the White House briefing room. And it's really simple. It's a room much smaller than this, seven seats across, seven deep. It's about 50 people in the room. Somebody raises their hand, and Jay answers the question. It's easy. That interaction is very easy. But our question was, how do we take that and scale it to the internet, the whole internet? That's a good question. So here's a, what our inspiration was. OK, there's that number again. Let's see if anybody guessed this. So 30-second history lesson. July of 1775, there's this thing called the Olive Branch Petition. And what this was, was a petition adopted by the Continental Congress to avoid war with Great Britain. It was a document authored by a guy with the last name Jefferson. You may be familiar. We really wanted to affirm our loyalty to this guy, King George. Well, he disagreed. He felt it was insincere, and it resulted in the formal proclamation of rebellion against Great Britain. Did anybody guess that? No history majors here. OK. So we all know what happened. It works out in our favor. And then a few years later, we have the United States Constitution. And the most important amendment that's always talked about is the First Amendment. Everybody knows this one. But I want to highlight the last sentence there, to petition the government for a redress of grievances. Why is that really important? Because that line there was in direct response to the rejection of the Olive Branch Petition. Now, as you can imagine, that is a really powerful source of inspiration for us. What are we going to call this thing? Hmm. We the people. Three of the most powerful words in American history. They need no introduction. Everybody knows what it is. That's a great brand. So we took that and we applied it to the application and we added the tagline, your voice in our government. And the operative word there is voice. Because it's about participating in government, it's about participating in our government. So what we're doing is we're coming up with a communication channel between the public and the president something that doesn't really exist. And it doesn't exist because what this is is a way for the White House to listen truly in an unfiltered way. It is a direct line of communication to the White House. And it's really exciting because this is technology that truly embodies and drives open government. OK, we've come up with this great idea. We have a great brand. But we need to figure out how to do this. And that's where my team comes into play. Well, I talked about platforms. So we need to leverage our platform. We have all the pieces. We have the tools. We have the modules. We have open source technology. And most importantly, we have engineers that can do this. Now, when building an application on this scale, it's really important to keep it simple. Keep it simple so you can get it out there quickly and engage with the public. Shift as much of you, the functionality to the second phase as possible because you want nothing to prevent you from getting your tool out there. This is something that's really important. Build security in from the beginning. What we're doing is we're really exposing the White House to something new, which is a different attack vector. There's inherent danger 
to accepting feedback from people. So you have to build an architect for security in the beginning. This one's also important, preparing the scale. We know that this is going to be very popular. We know that a lot of people are going to use this. Now come launch day, come launch hour, I don't want my engineers to come to me and say, we're going to need a bigger boat. You need to think about this and you need to be proactive and scale this in the beginning. And then get ready to launch. But recognize that you can't really prepare for everything. You can be as proactive as possible, but something always goes wrong. It's Murphy's Law. Everybody knows it. And your key to success really is how do you react to that as quickly as possible and address those bottlenecks and issues immediately. Don't be naive and think that there will not be a problem. There is always a problem. Launch minute. Thursday, the 22nd of September. Three hours of sleep. These guys can vouch for that. They might have had less than me. I only had three, they probably had two. The official notification email went out. You're the first to know. So the first month, what happened? Well, it was pretty popular. I think those stats speak for themselves. Over a million signatures, 12 and a half thousand petitions. At peak, we had about a thousand users per hour signing up. And this one's really interesting. We had a 45% increase in traffic on our website. That's pretty cool. So clearly, we were successful here. And what was clear was that what was really exciting was that we leveraged open source technology to reinvent how citizens communicate with their president and how the president communicates with citizens. This is a big deal. This has never been done before. It's almost a revolutionary idea. So, quick show of hands here. How many people have used the system? Not bad. If you haven't, do it later. So some metrics, we have about 1.9 million users now. 32,000 petitions, two and a half million signatures. But the stat that speaks the most and tells us that this is really successful and really was our goal was that answering thing, responding. The White House has responded to 68 petitions. That's about half a million people three quarters of a million people that now have a direct answer from the White House. That wasn't possible a few years ago. Okay, so now what? We have this tool, what do we do? Are we done? Well, let's remember that this is not a linear process. We're always evolving, we're always iterating, so Like Dries said, this is circular. Continuous innovation. We acknowledge and recognize that this is not a perfect system and it never will be, nor should it ever be perfect because we're always changing and we're always evolving it. We need to learn from our weakness. We need to learn from our failures. We don't allow ourselves to have the mindset that we know everything we want to leverage the knowledge of those out there that are using it. So how do we improve we the people? Well, one of the ways is to leverage that knowledge by listening. We want to listen to the feedback that people out there have about our tool. Is it good? Is it bad? What works? What does not work? And we want to engage in communication with the people out there that are using it. Why is it good? Why is it bad? 
And that's really collaborating. We need to collaborate with the public. Because when you do that, you're really embracing that community that I'm talking about. And when you embrace the community, you have a huge multiplier effect. And that's really powerful. That's good for the White House. And that's great for the community. OK. So how do we do that? How do we collaborate? Well, the biggest step forward is this. We need to take the source code and release it to the community. We've done this before. We have a number of modules out there that we've released. Some of you may have used some of these. Node Embed, for example, is used by over a thousand sites. Gov Delivery, used by a lot of government organizations out there. And Akamai, the definition of large scale Drupal. So let's remember that this is really bigger than us. The president himself said at the United Nations that we'll share this technology with the rest of the world. Now imagine that. Imagine if we could have we the people across different cities, states, countries. Not everybody can afford to build this technology. And it's important to open sources because the money that we use to pay for this is taxpayer money. It's not government's money. It's the public's money. And this shows ROI on that investment. Put it out there and let other people benefit from it. That's the power of open source. It's better to share. Sorry, I couldn't avoid this photo. It's irresistible. <laughs> So what did we learn in this process? Well, we learned that Drupal is something that's ready for enterprise applications. Something that accepts 2.5 million signatures, in my mind, is enterprise. And it allowed, a, allowed us to power citizen engagement. There's a real hunger and passion for open government. There are a lot of people out there that really, really embrace it. And we want that because we really embrace it. Here's the thing that nobody likes to talk about, but it's true. You cannot prepare for everything. Something always goes wrong. And your success really is based on how you react to something breaking or messing up on launch day. You can be as proactive as possible, and you have to be as proactive as possible. But reacting on that day is really, really important. And that's where I put a tremendous amount of faith in my team of engineers. So that's what we took away. And this is what I want you to take away from this. I want you to think of a website as a web platform. Because when you have a platform, you have something on top of which you can build applications. And you can build applications to engage your customers, your supporters, your constituents, your members, whatever the nomenclature. It's a little bit of a paradigm shift. Remember, the tools of today will not solve your problems tomorrow. You need to be evolving and continuously innovating. Don't be afraid to embrace emerging technologies. Here's that fun one. If you repeat it three times, I think you'll remember it. You cannot plan for everything. 
something will always go wrong. How you react to that will define your success. And last, but certainly not least, and probably one of the reasons why you're here in this room and at DrupalCon is because open source technology enables the security, stability, and scalability of the president's website, and namely, that's Drupal. And if it's good enough for the president, it's probably good enough for you guys. Thank you. Now I guess we could take some questions if you have questions, or if you don't have questions now, you can ask me later. Uh, I'm a friendly guy, you can stop me in the hallway. You wanna go to the mic so everybody can hear? during the lame duck period there was something called the citizens briefing book where you could vote on like uh, top suggestions to give the president and uh, it reminds me a bit of the um, slash petition uh, URL you have now but um, at, at that time I remember the suggestion that the president start being honest about UFOs was ranked very highly and so I wonder how uh, you deal with the question of participation when people who are just crazy want to participate. Sure. Uh, the word crazy is open to interpretation, right? Uh, I think, and we think, that everybody should participate. Mm -hmm. We're not going to let anybody or shut anybody out. Uh, and we'll answer them with the official administration response. Uh, so you can answer or ask, sorry, whatever question you want uh, on We the People. And if there are 25,000 or more signatures, there will be an official administration response. Mm -hmm. And if we didn't do that, there would be no adoption of this, right? Mm -hmm. People would not think that we were credible. So it's really important for us to uh, encourage participation from anybody and everybody, regardless of their opinion, regardless of uh, whether some people think that it's a, a little bit out there with what they're thinking. Um, anybody should be able to participate. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Tom. Uh, Jason Hibbets with opensource.com. I've got two questions. First, um, do, you, do you and the White House.gov team see any inspiration from the uh, Icelandic Constitution, how they basically crowdsource their Constitution? Sorry. Um, did, did the White House.gov team get any inspiration from the, when the Icelandic Constitution was crowdsourced and basically how they rewrote their Constitution from their people? Yes. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, it's a little different in this country, obviously, because the scale of this country is, uh, you know, orders of magnitude larger than Iceland. But absolutely, things like, um, I really admire what Iceland is doing, embracing social media to uh, have that participatory government. Uh, we also had a source of inspiration in the UK. They did petitions as well. Uh, their model was a little different, uh, where if they had, if a petition had 100,000 signatures on it, they would agree to debate it on the parliament floor. So absolutely, we look to different countries uh, for inspiration, and sometimes countries come to us as well for inspiration. So there's that uh, collaboration that I'm talking about, which is not only with uh, individuals out there, but across governments. That's really important. And now time for the curveball. So uh, we're going to have a change of administration, whether it's one year or five years away. What are you guys doing to plan, or are there any uh, any thoughts on how you can make this White House to go more independent and not really reflect the ideals of the current president, but to make it a platform, as you said? Thank you. Right. Um, yes, that is a curveball, and you're right that uh, there will be an administration change either in one year or five years. Uh, it's just the way that things go in the White House where if a new president comes in, that president is allowed to decorate the Oval Office however he or she wants. Uh, so it's a matter of whatever the incoming administration wants to do, that's, that's what's gonna happen. Uh, fortunately for me, I was not actually uh, present during the transition, uh, and I heard that it was one of the most chaotic uh, scenes possible, uh, because it really is, a lot of people are coming in, a lot of people are going out. So uh, chaos really describes it, it's really challenging. 
How you doing? First of all, I want to say you did a really nice job on this presentation. Thank you. Um, I'll give you 20 bucks later. <laughs> actually, he actually took my exact question, so. <laughs> I okay, guess you can ask question, me later if you want. No, my other question was, uh, can we get a copy of this presentation in any way? Um, yes, I could probably do that. Um, I could probably do that. Not right now, but I will. Clearly. Yeah, come talk to me after. Uh, email me. Don't don't hesitate. Hey, call me if you want. I'm I'm happy to talk to you, uh, and I'm happy to get you the presentation if, if you'd like it. Thank you. Sure. Hi. Um, I'm just curious what your thoughts are on possible implications of this platform. That um, when our government was founded, there was, of course, as it is today, a representative democracy. So we voted to have our voices heard, because communication is at the speed of the fastest horse, but currently it's at the speed of light with platforms such as these. Um, doesn't this sort of take away the need for a representative to hear our voice? Uh, that is a difficult question for me to answer in public. Uh, I'm going to say it, <laughs> it does not take away the need for representation. Uh, I think this is a way to augment uh, representation because this is a way for our elected uh, officials to really see uh, what people want to talk about. If they want to talk about UFOs, then we'll have to answer that. We can't ignore people. Uh, this only uh, expands the ability to listen to more people and more opinions, so I think it's better. Thank you. Yep. How much oversight in terms of a staff person is constantly looking at the site and the responses and the petitions on a day-to-day -day basis? Uh, well, there's a, there's a team of them. Uh, there's a handful, at least, that look at it on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, and we also obviously have a terms of participation. Uh, and if a petition does not comply with the terms of participation, then you, know, you have to take that petition down. It's similar to Facebook. If you don't comply with their terms of participation, you lose your account. Uh, so in terms of oversight, as well as who's watching for petitions that cross thresholds, we have a whole team of uh, people that are doing that on the strategy side, but we also have technology built in that helps us uh, know when things cross thresholds. So we don't have to monitor and have eyeballs on 30,000 petitions. That's just not a scalable solution. Uh, we need technology to do that. So we augment it. Uh, we augment, you know, we put technology and people together to do that. Okay, and my second question, uh, you were taught that in the pr presentation they were talking about, you know, having we the people or something like we the people being available to all the governments, is that, does that mean like there's a plan in place or there's something available where a government of any size could take something like we the people and then just kind of implement it for their own personal, their own city or government website, whether it's, you know, Iceland or Australia or the city of North Glen up the street? Right, uh, correct. So the goal, uh, as the president stated when he was at the United Nations, uh, was really to release the source code. Uh, it's not as easy as just saying, poof, here you go. Uh, there's a significant amount of work that has to be done on our end, but the goal is to take that and give it out to the community because when you uh, allow the community to work on it, you really bubble up good software and make it great. Uh, also, they, the cities, countries, whatever, can take that code, and the goal is to allow them to install it and run it themselves. So they have their own We the People. They don't have to call it We the People, of course, but basically they can have their own crowdsourced petition tool uh, for their uh, communities. Uh, during the presentation, you talked about uh, when you chose Drupal, uh, the uh, the tough road they had to because of the culture uh, and open data, open government, open source. Um, I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about how this new platform has impacted that culture within mm -hmm. the public service and the government, and uh, with the eye to the you know making it something. Uh, like the other question, making it more of a permanent way of communicating with the public. Mm -hmm. So at the White House, we recognize, and we don't take this lightly, that we often are looked at as an example. Uh, so we also have the burden of doing it right. Uh, because if we mess up and someone looks at us as an example, well, they're going to copy us and they might mess up as well. So. Our goal really is to embrace open source technologies, uh, things like Drupal, uh, to set that good example across government. 
in terms of using this as a way to improve open government across uh, different agencies and organizations, uh, I would say that we have seen an, an uptick in that. Uh, we've seen significant uh, positive response as a result of doing this because this is not something that's been done before. Uh, so we're really trying to uh, set a high bar here. Uh, a rising tide lifts all ships. Uh, so that's really the goal. Thanks. So if there aren't any more questions, thank you very much. If you have questions, you can stop me in the hallway. I'm happy to answer them. Uh, thanks for coming.